Amen. Luke chapter 13, we left off in the discussion where in verse 22, uh, Jesus was going through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. He's going towards his goal of Jerusalem, in which he will accomplish his death, burial, and resurrection. And then verse 23, Lord, one of them ask, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, verse 24, strive to enter in through the narrow gate. For many I say to you will seek to enter and will not be able. <coughs> Excuse me, last week we talked about strive and striving, what that word means. It means if we wish to get into the narrow gate that leads to heaven, we've got to strive, and that means putting effort into what we do, just as the athletes would. This word here is used to describe the athletes and their competition. That uh, someone who is going to com compete in athletic events would strive. And the answer to the question that Jesus is giving here is that there are many who want to go to heaven. They want to go to a better place after this life is over with, but are not going to because they're not going through that narrow gate that they are to strive to enter into. And he says in verse 25, when once the master of the house is risen up and you shut the door and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and knock, at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. So that's a, a, a contemporary uh, situation there where the people said, we know you, you ate and drank with us. You preached in our streets in verse 27 but he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, you, you workers of iniquity. Verse 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourself thrust out. So here we have in verse 28 a picture very briefly of hell and of heaven. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where is that going to be? Hell, agony, pain, torment, forever. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, where is that going to be? Heaven. And there's really no in-between. There isn't an in-between. It's either hell or heaven. So those who would not accept and follow and strive to follow Jesus Christ, that means put every effort into it, and that means giving 100%. And not a half-hearted effort, but a 100% following of Jesus Christ, uh, they're not going to enter into heaven. In verse 28, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets will be there. And he says, you yourselves will be thrust out. And last week, we very briefly touched on this at the very end of our um, lesson. He's noting here that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be in heaven. I don't think he would mention those three names unless they would be in the kingdom of God. And this is speaking of the kingdom of God in the glorified uh, sense of heaven. He would not mention those three names if they weren't going to be there. And I believe that he's making it very clear that these three individuals will be in heaven. And that they will still be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, they retain their identity even though they are in a, in a different environment, so to speak, in a different realm or dimension, they are still Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> and it has been concluded from this also that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would most likely recognize one another. Therefore, there is recognition of who uh, others are in uh, the next life. You remember when Jesus was transfigured and Moses and Elijah appeared, Peter, James, and John knew that that was Moses and Elijah. Well, they didn't know them personally. However, somehow it was revealed to them uh, that Moses and Elijah uh, were the ones appearing with Christ when he was transfigured. So there's recognition of identity also. 
Verse 29, Then uh, they will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south and sit down in the kingdom of God. That's talking about the Gentiles. The Gentiles, those who are afar off, it's usually described as those who are near the Jews and those who are afar off. You read about that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 39. The promises unto you and to your children and to those who are far off, the Gentiles, as many as the Lord our God will call. You also found, find that phraseology in, in Ephesians chapter 2 where it talks about the Gentiles or the uncircumcised being afar off, brought nigh or brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's saying, look, you're here, you're seeing me, you're eating with me, you're in my presence, you're hearing my teaching, but if you're not going to follow me, in heaven, there's going to be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they're going to sit down with all the prophets. The imagery there is sitting down at a great feast. He's going to talk about feasting together in um, uh, Luke chapter 14. It, that denotes fellowship, uh, friendship, intimacy, uh, a place of communion, so to speak. You're, they're going to be there, and the prophets, but you yourselves are going to be thrust out. You're not going to be able to be in heaven. And, verse 29, the Gentiles are going to be there. Those whom you despise are going to be there because they will follow me and they will strive to enter into that narrow gate. So verse 30, indeed, there will be the last who will be first and there will be the first who will be last. The first who thought they were going to be in heaven, well, the Jews, well, they're going to be the last. And those who are considered last, those who are considered the ones who aren't going to make it, the Gentiles, they will be first in the sense of uh, being saved and being willing to follow Jesus Christ. So the way that they perceived things was going to be very different from the way things are really going to be. Nicodemus was told in John chapter 3, you've got to be born again to enter the kingdom of God, born of water and the Spirit. Why did Jesus tell him that? Because Nicodemus, as a Pharisee of the Jews, thought, well, just because he was a Jew, he was going to automatically be in the kingdom of heaven. That was their thought. Well, just because we're descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we're going to be in there. No. You've got to follow Jesus. You've got to strive. You've got to obey him. How many people today who come from a Christian family think that they're going to be in heaven simply because mom and daddy were good Christian people and grandma and grandpa were good Christian people and therefore just somehow they're going to get into heaven on their coattails. The point is we're going to be judged individually whether we strove and, 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 and follow Jesus Christ or not. We cannot rely upon pedigree or heritage. We're going to be judged individually. We must each one give an account of ourselves to God. So salvation is very individual uh, when it comes to this um, concept of striving. We have to uh, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. I think that's Philippians 2 and verse 10. Work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. We cannot do it for anyone else and no one else can do it for us. Any questions or comments about that before we go any further? <clears throat> Look at verse 31, Luke chapter 13 and verse 31. On that day, some Pharisees came saying to him, Get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons, perform cures today, tomorrow, and on the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. So he's being warned here to leave. Uh, the very, some of the Pharisees came saying, you need to get out of here. This may have been some of the Pharisees that were actually uh, friendly towards Christ. Most of the Pharisees uh, were at odds with Jesus. This must have been some that were um, more friendly towards his teaching, uh, like someone like Nicodemus. Uh, of John chapter 3. <clears throat> and he tells them, um, you go and tell that fox. And he's referring to Herod, 
uh, as a fox. And this re refers to the ruler's uh, craftiness and slyness. Uh, also, um, in the literature of the rabbis, fox is used to describe a man that is meaningless or insignificant. Herod was the king of the Jews, but how was he the king of the Jews? Because the Roman Empire pretty much installed him. He was a puppet king. Uh, was not uh, the whole Herod family pretty much were a bunch of immoral people. You read and study the Herodian family, the Herodian dynasty. It was a bunch of immoral individuals. And they were the ones who were placed in power over Palestine by the Roman Empire. So in, in essence, they were just puppet kings of the Roman Empire. So in that sense, he was insignificant. And Jesus used the word fox here. Uh, verse 32, uh, he says, I'm going to cast out demons, perform cures today, tomorrow, and on the third day I shall be perfected. He's using these days prophetically. It wasn't three days until he was about to be crucified. He's using these days in the sense of look, saying, look, God has a, a timetable that is unfolding and Herod is not going to stop it. Herod is not going to uh, kill me and, and put an end to God's timetable. Uh, there were often times you find in the book of John where the Jews <coughs> excuse me, got very angry with Jesus to the point they wanted to kill him. In fact, sometimes they'd pick up stones and they were just ready to throw them at him. But Jesus passed through the midst of them because it said his hour had not yet come. His hour had not yet come. But then when it gets up to the time of his crucifixion for him to be arrested, Jesus said, my hour has come. In other words, there was a timetable for all this to happen and the time in which Jesus died in his life was exactly according to God's timetable. And what he's saying here is Herod is not going to overthrow God's timetable. There is a timetable that's unfolding and it will be accomplished. So in verse 33, he says, Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the center point of Israel and also it was the place where prophets were killed, prophets were persecuted. Uh, when they would come and they would speak against the immorality that was going on, uh, they in the Old Testament, they were killed uh, in that city. They were persecuted mainly from Jerusalem. Now here you have the ultimate prophet, the very son of God, and he's saying, I'm going to Jerusalem and, and I'm going to face my death there. So the today, tomorrow, and the third day represents God's timetable. There's certain things that, are, that have to transpire, the casting out of demons and the performing of cures. Then this will take place. Herod is not going to stop it. You remember uh, another Herod, the, uh, I believe it's the father of this Herod that tried to have Jesus killed when he was a baby. But it didn't stop it. It didn't stop Christ. God in his providence had them go down to Egypt until that Herod died. So uh, I believe it was his father that uh, tried to have the little uh, baby boys that were born, what was it, two years and under? killed because he had heard from the wise men a, a, a king was being born and he didn't want a rival. So he had all those uh, Jewish boys killed two years and under and uh, Jesus was protected then. God's timetable will not be thwarted. His will will be accomplished. So that's basically, basically what you have in verses 31 through 33. Look at verse 34 and 35. You find... <clears throat> that Jesus is lamenting uh, over Jerusalem. You find this at the end of uh, Matthew chapter 24 as well, uh, where I believe it states that um, 
say it's the end of Matthew chapter 23, uh, where he is talking about Jerusalem. Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39. Luke chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, you have this as well. He's weeping or lamenting over Jerusalem and their attitude. Remember what he just said in verse 33. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. Why? Because they keep resisting God's prophets. That's why. That's why he says in verse 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, and assuredly I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So here you have Jesus uh, showing his great concern over Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the capital, of course, Israel, the God's people. The temple was there, but things had become so corrupt there to the point where they, they would kill the prophets and stone those who were sent to her. And he's saying, I would have gathered you together. I would have saved you. I would have gathered you together like a, uh, uh, as children, as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. You see a hen gathering the chicks under her wings to protect those chicks. But you were not willing. The Bible makes it very clear we have a will. Jeremiah chapter 18, Ezekiel chapter 18, both make it very clear that we have choices to make. Whether we're going to follow God or whether we're not. And Jerusalem had a choice to make. In Jerusalem, he's talking about the inhabitants there. Uh, I was going to save you. I'd be willing to save you, but you're, you wouldn't come to me. You were not willing. And because they rejected him, he says in verse 35, see your house is left to you desolate. House there uh, may refer to the temple, of course, where, where God's temple was located there in Jerusalem. But they had abandoned God and, and, and left him behind, even though they thought they were serving God. They had left him behind. And therefore, he's saying, your house is left to you desolate. And it can also refer to the entire nation. They have abandoned God, therefore God would abandon them. And he says, surely I say to you, you will not, uh, you will not see me until you say, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that is uh, from Psalm uh, 118, I believe it is. Uh, Psalm 118 and verse 26, in which in that context there, it's talking about the stone that was rejected. Jesus is the stone that was rejected who would become the chief cornerstone. Until the Jewish people say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, until they accept him, uh, they were not going to see him. See him in the sense of him being their savior. So there, there is no hope for anyone that rejects Christ, the Jewish individual even to this day, who have been taught to reject Christ in their religion, and they're still looking for a Messiah to fulfill those Old Testament prophets, they, they will not see Jesus until they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and they see him in the New Testament that they, at this time, reject. And therefore, there, there is nothing else for them, because he is the Messiah, even though they do not accept that at this time. Any questions or comments? You see the, the, the intense compassion of Jesus here in verse 34 and 35. I want to save you, but Jesus never forces his will on anyone. And neither should we. Someone has to be willing to come to Christ. That's why when we, when we spread the gospel throughout our community, we invite. We're not going to go up to someone and coerce them into a Bible study. We're not going to go up to someone and pressure them into the baptistry to be baptized. 
Jesus did not operate that way. If you try to convince someone against their will, they will be of the same opinion still. That's what Johnny Ramsey would say. You're just getting them wet. That's all you're doing. If you baptize someone who really doesn't want to be. So it has to be willing. They have to be willing to come to Jesus Christ. And we, uh, we make the invitation. We give the invitation. We place it before people. We're here. We'll study with you. But they've got to put forth that effort. And if they're not willing to do that, then, then there's nothing that we can do. All we can do is plant the seed and let them, uh, those who receive the seed, let it uh, germinate. And sometimes that takes more time than we are patient for because we want immediate results. But we have to have uh, patience. Look at chapter 14, Luke chapter 14. <clears throat> it says, Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. And he took him and healed him and let him go. And he answered and said to them, uh, saying, Which of you having a donkey or an ox that is fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath? And they could not answer him regarding these things. It's interesting, Jesus is going into the house of a Pharisee uh, once again, and he is eating on the Sabbath there. And, and notice verse 1, it says that he watched him closely. Why were they watching him closely? To learn from him? To see if he would mess up to see if they could catch him in something. They're scrutinizing him. They're putting him under a microscope, as it were, watching every move he makes to see if they can accuse him of something. So it makes you wonder why he's even invited to the Pharisee's house to begin with. Could it be almost like a trap? So they, they could see you know, what, what he's doing to see if he would actually uh, heal on the Sabbath? And there was a man there who had dropsy. And dropsy is the retention by the body of excess water. It's a, a word that's a medical term in the Greek, a word that is, appears only here in the Greek New Testament. It only appears in the gospel according to Luke. And what's significant about that? What was Luke? A doctor. Luke was a physician. So it's not surprising that he would actually use a medical term here uh, of dropsy to describe this condition of retaining uh, too much water. And so here's a person who had uh, dropsy. And uh, verse 3, Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now sometimes Jesus was asked questions and then sometimes Jesus would ask questions. He would ask them questions. And he's asking them a question. But verse 4 says they kept silent. And he took him and healed him and let him go. So he healed the man of his dropsy and then let him go. And then he asked another question. Which of you having a donkey or an oxen that has fallen to a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? This is uh, very similar to what you find in chapter 13 with a woman who was stooped over for 18 years and he healed on the Sabbath day and they began to criticize him. The ruler of the synagogue began to gripe and bellyache about him helping this woman. And then he's doing it again on the Sabbath day. You see the boldness of Jesus? He wasn't a coward. He knew this was something that they did not like happening, but yet he would do it again right in front of them. Not out of meanness. But he's trying to prove a point. The point is, there's nothing wrong with doing what's right on the Sabbath. It does not violate the law of Moses to do what's right. It might violate your traditions. But it is not wrong to uh, have compassion on someone 
and to heal on the Sabbath. And again, the point he's making in verse 5, you have more compassion over a donkey and an oxen that falls into a pit than some human being that has a real need. So the hypocrisy that they had of being willing to help out an animal that's in need on the Sabbath and not thinking they're violating the Sabbath. And here's Jesus, besides the fact he's performing a miracle, being criticized for performing that miracle on the Sabbath. Instead of being in awe of his power, they're going to see whether he is going to perform that power on the Sabbath so they could accuse him. So there, one way, one method of teaching someone is asking questions. You find this in the teaching of Christ. Remember, Jesus is the master teacher. We can learn how to teach from studying the life of Christ. He asked two questions, verse 3 and verse 5. And that's a way to get people to think, is to ask questions. But notice, notice verse 6, they could not answer him regarding these things. Remember, he asked this to a lawyer and a Pharisee. A lawyer was one of the scholars of the Jewish people, highly educated individual. The Pharisees were known for their high education. Here's the carpenter son from Nazareth putting them on the spot. But of course we know he was much more than just a carpenter's son. Therefore, the animosity is going to build. The closer we get to the end of the book, that's going to lead up to his crucifixion. Verse uh, 7 through 14 talks about having a um, lowly or humble attitude. So he told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places saying to them. The same type of setting, he's in the Pharisee's house and he noticed people taking the best spots and where to sit. Verse 8, when you're invited to anyone... Uh, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited him uh, come and say to you, give place to this man, and then you begin with shame to take the lowliest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowliest place so that when he who invited you goes, he may say uh, to you, friend, go up higher then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he said to him who invited him, When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Remember, he's in the he is in the rulers. Uh, he is one of the in the house one of the rulers of the Pharisees. He's eating with them, and he noticed how people like to try to get the best seat. And and, and some of these wealthier houses back then they had a lot, almost like a, a U shaped couch in which uh, the, peop the person who sat in the middle would be the one that's the most honored, so to speak. And the, they would come in and they, the people who thought they deserved it would automatically go to that chief seat. And he says, when you're invited to a wedding feast, uh, don't sit down in the best place because, you know, if you assume that's where you're supposed to sit and someone more important than you comes in, then you're going to be humiliated when you're asked to step down. Instead, go to the lowly spot. And then the friend will come to you in verse, uh, verse 10 and say, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence that are all that, of all who are there. The point is, don't exalt yourself. Let someone else do it. Don't assume... That, that you deserve the best, take the lowly position and 
someone else will come and exalt you. Don't Here's a principle here. You don't brag on yourself. You don't boast on yourself. Some Christians will tell you how great a Christian they are. And that violates this principle here. First of all, it indicates pride. And if you're proud of being a great Christian, that's just as bad as being prideful of anything else. If the devil can get us with pride, he can get us with being proud about being a Christian. And pride comes before a fall. So it's the attitude of being humble and, and not seeking the chief seats. And, and this is a message uh, for anyone that don't, don't, don't wish to be in the spotlight. Have a humble, lowly attitude and let someone else exalt you. Let someone else uh, brag about you. Don't boast about yourself or don't exalt yourself. And this, this is a problem that some preachers have. You see this in the religious world all the time. And where it says there in verse 11, he who, he who exalts himself will be humbled. God will humble you, definitely in this life and certainly in the next life. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. How many people exalt themselves in the religious world? They have these special clothing that they walk around in and they're indicating that they are clergy and their father so-and-so or reverend so-and-so. And they have these exalted titles. One day they'll be humbled. One day they will be humbled. What, what is the one who is the head of Catholicism called by his followers? Holy Father. Blasphemy. One day he and all those that would exalt him will be humbled. Jesus, the very Son of God, came down here and, and he was born into this world in a stable. Very lowly conditions. He was born to poor parents. You know that from Luke chapter 2 because of the sacrifice that they gave in the case that they were poor. He said at one point, foxes have holes, birds of the hair have nests. I don't have anywhere to lay my head. If you really want to follow me, you're not going to get rich. This isn't a get-rich-quick scheme. It's going to take sacrifice. So you have the lowly Son of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. You remember on the Passover that we're not even to yet in chapter 14, but in John's account at the Passover, what does he do? He girds himself with a towel and washes their dirty feet. Think about that. The one who created the cosmos. The word who was with God and was God. Got down and did the work of, of cleaning up their dirty feet. That's what a lowly slave would do. None of the other apostles would do it. They weren't willing to humble themselves and do it. But Jesus, the Son of God, got down there and he did it. That would be equivalent to going over to someone's house and cleaning their toilet if you want to put it in modern day setting. So you, you see the humble attitude of Jesus willing to, to humble himself and, 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 and then be crucified and then resurrected. Now he's exalted as King of kings and Lord of lords. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted and we don't exalt ourselves. We allow others to exalt us. <coughs> there are those even in the church that have, have this problem when you think of the chief seats and everything. I heard a story about a, a congregation up in New York, a, a church of Christ, where the preacher has an office that's connected to the stage that goes out to the pulpit. And he stays behind in the office while the church is worshiping on Sunday until it comes to the Lord's Supper. Then he'll walk out of his office and sit down behind the pulpit as if he's sitting on a throne and they'll give the, the Lord's Supper to him. But he doesn't sit down there with the, the rest of the brethren. It's as if he's a celebrity. That exaltation, that, 
that a magnifying of a preacher. Uh, and that is something that is contrary to the word of God. And humility will happen as a result of that. In verse 12, he goes on uh, to talk about how that we should help those who are in need. He says, when you give a dinner and he's talking to the one who invited him, <coughs> Do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. He's not saying it's wrong to invite these people to your dinner. But if you do it, lest they pay you back. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. That type of attitude. He's saying if you really want to be humble and you want to help people, verse 13, you give a feast, invite the poor the maimed, the lame, the blind, then you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. In other words, if you only help people just so that they'll help you, you won't be blessed by God. But if you help people because it's the right thing to do, whether they help you or not, that should be our attitude, to help people who are in need, whether they have any intention or have any ability to pay us back, it, because it's God's will, we should help them. He says in verse 14, you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. That's talking about the end of time when we are resurrected. That's when you will be repaid for the good that you have done. So you see here Jesus talking about in verses 8 through 11 that we should have a humble attitude and let someone else exalt us. God will exalt us to, to a certain extent in this life and certainly in the life to come if we have a humble attitude. And so we should have the attitude that is lowly and let others speak of us, not toot our own horn, so to speak, and brag on ourselves. Then in verses 12 through 14, he talks about how that we should help those who are less fortunate, those who cannot repay us, for the sake of helping them, not helping people or inviting people or doing good to people so that they can repay us. That should not uh, be our attitude. Our reward is in the next life, verse 14, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. In verses 15 through 24, any questions or comments about what we've talked about? He gives the parable of the Great Supper in verses 15 through 24. We're going to have to go through this very, very quickly and we'll, we'll touch on it again <clears throat> later on. Now one of, the, one of those who sat at the table uh, with him heard these things. He said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. That's talking about the fellowship that's going to happen in the kingdom of God. Verse 16 and he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper, invited many, and he sent his servants at the supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. When they with one accord began to make excuses, the first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it and ask that you have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to test them. I ask that you have me excused. Verse 20, still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Excuses, excuses. Verse 21, so the servant came and reported these things to his master, and the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring here the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go into the highways and the hedges, compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. The parable of the great supper. We even sing an invitation song. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Talking about salvation, that great that great feast that has been made available, and it's an honor to be invited, an honor to receive this gospel invitation, then you have people who are too focused on the here and now. 
and they begin to make excuses. It says in verse 18, uh, they with all, with one accord began to make excuses. Excuses that people give for not being faithful to the Lord. Excuses that people give for not striving to follow Jesus Christ. Excuses that people give aren't going to hold up on the day of judgment. And so you see that there is a great invitation that's given and the excuses that people have, they're too concerned about this life. I got five uh, yoke of oxen. I'm going to test them. Another says I'm married. I cannot come. Another bought a piece of land. They have to go see it. Notice all these are earthly things that are just for the here and now. Even the marriage. There's not going to be any marriage in heaven. We'll see that later on in the book of Luke. Marriage is only for this life. That's why a widow or a widower can remarry when their spouse dies. So all of these things distract people from the great invitation. And the point is we must keep our focus or we will miss out on the blessed supper or that great feast that awaits the faithful. We'll continue with Luke chapter 14 uh, next week, Lord willing.